we had so many glitches and technical difficulties and things that were trying to go backwards this morning. I forgot to get my Bible out of my briefcase. But uh, here we go. How many of you believe this is God's Word? From cover to cover, with the exception of anything that's below the line on the page where somebody's made a commentary or the introductions or anything like that, all Scripture is God-breathed. We believe that, right? And if all Scripture is God-breathed and all Scripture comes from God, that means God has a message in His Word, not just for whom He was speaking to in the beginning, but for us now, right? Because the Bible's closed. There is no new revelation from God. Everything that God wants us to know about Him is in here. Now, there are things that will be revealed to us someday when we meet Him face to face, right? Anybody believe that? But there's nothing new under the sun, as Solomon said, and we need to look at God's Word, and we need to learn how to apply it to our lives with the understanding as this whole sermon series talks about the fact that eventually everyone is going to answer to God. Everyone. Whether they're believers or whether they're not believers, they're going to answer to God. We're all going to bow in front of Jesus Christ one of these days, and we're going to say Jesus is Lord. And if we belong to him, we're going to enter into his rest, and people who don't belong to him are going to find themselves separated from God for eternity. Think about that with me for a minute. I, uh, I was listening to, I was editing some of my sermons for the radio uh, for this week, I turned in some, about a month's worth of sermons to WCBC, and one of the sermons that, uh, the sermon series that I was putting on the radio was back when we were talking about how it was popular and is still popular to change what the Bible says to match what people believe today or what people want to hear today. And we've said it, and we continue to say it, that God's Word was written the way it's written, and it means what it means, and it says what it says, and He's not going to change what He means or what He says to match what we believe or don't believe. Correct? God is never changing. He is the one constant in the world that we find ourselves in. And today, we're going to talk about complacency and how complacency leads to danger. Complacency. Now, Sometimes we hear those words and we say we think we know what they mean, and we're going to give you a little definition here in a minute, but I got a few things that I'd like to say. False confidence and complacency plague church people as well as avowed unbelievers. Complacency not only affects unbelievers, but it affects people who go to church too. Complacency. Now, agnostics, or cowards as I like to call them, And atheists believe there is no God in whom whom they must answer. Now, the reason I call an agnostic a coward is an agnostic won't come right out and say there is no God, but they also won't surrender their lives to God. So they want to ride the pine. They want to ride the fence. They want to stay right in the middle. And an atheist is willing to say there is no God. But when you push an atheist as far as you can, they can't prove that there's no God because their theories just don't hold up. And their ideas of how the world started and things like that become scientific fantasy. Aliens came and seeded this planet. You're just pod people. Anybody ever seen the old movie? The old, it was probably on one of those Mystery Science 3000s or Elvira, Queen of the Darkness movies back way back in the 70s and 80s um, called Invasion of the Pod People where everybody came out of a milkweed pod. And if you believe that aliens seeded the earth and you came out of a milkweed pod, I got a problem for you. One of these days you may just explode and all the fibers will just come out everywhere and the wind will blow it all over the place like milkweeds do, right? But we who understand who God is and we who understand that God loves us and that God has a plan for us and that God has given us the most amazing gift that's ever been given in the world in the person of Jesus Christ who came and died for our sins. And when Jesus came, the Bible says we were God's enemies, like I mentioned earlier, but God loved humanity so much that he provided a way for us to escape eternal death. And as we look at it, atheists believe that you're just on this earth and you're gone. There's nothing else. There's no trace of you. There's no consciousness after you leave the earth. But the Bible tells us that we are created body, soul, and spirit. The body dies, correct? Because the wages of sin is death and everybody's infected by sin, so our bodies die. But our soul and our spirit are eternal. 
And when you go to a funeral and you see that body laying there, that is not the person who died. That's not the person who was alive. That's the container, the body that they were in. Who they really were, their soul and their spirit, if they belong to Jesus Christ, are already with him. And if not, the Bible says that the alternate for them is to be um, in hell. And so as we think about it, it's kind of unfair to the world and kind of silly to believe that God would not punish evil people, isn't it? It's kind of hard to believe that God wouldn't punish evil people. But some people don't understand that everybody's evil until they repent of their sins and turn their life over to Jesus Christ, even if they're good people, right? So nobody wants to see good people damaged. But as we think about it, a lot of people who call themselves Christians live like practical atheists. They live like practical atheists. They'll acknowledge God for an hour on a Sunday, once a week, but they live the rest of their life like God doesn't exist. Unless, unless what? Unless catastrophe comes, unless heartache comes, unless brokenness happens, then people want to cry out to God. Here's the thing that we need to understand. God is God of every moment of your life. Every breath you take, God owns that. The Bible says that God knew how many days we're going to be on the earth before we're ever born, and he has a purpose for us. He says that in Psalm 139. And why, if we are so fearfully and wonderfully and carefully made, and God made us in his image, and God gives us the opportunity to have salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, why would we take for granted the fact that we should spend a lot more time than what we do, worshiping, serving, honoring God, loving God, telling people about God? Why do we just assume that God's going to take care of all of our problems like he's our wingman, right? Is God more than a wingman? God is way more than a wingman, right? So as we look at who God is, we got to quit living like God doesn't exist when we're around other people. We got to be the light in the world. We got to be the salt of the world. We've got to bring flavor to this world. This world tastes pretty bad right now, doesn't it? Spiritually, it's bad. And what's going on in our world is not a battle against people, it's a battle against evil. It's a battle against Satan and the forces of evil. Everywhere we look, Satan is trying to twist and turn and make things different than what God intends for them to be. Okay, well, we're going to get here to uh, Amos chapter 6, but I'd like to read, uh, I, I normally don't read what somebody else said, right? I, I, don't, I, don't, I hate to go to church where all you get is this guy says this, and this guy says that, and this guy says this, because when you come here, what do you hear? The Bible says this, the Bible says this, and but there are things that we see within Christianity where there, it doesn't matter what stripe or brand of Christianity is, there are godly people somewhere in that mix. And a gentleman named Chad Walsh wrote this, and I'd like to share it with you this morning. He said, millions of Christians live in a sentimental haze of vague piety with soft organ music trembling in the lovely light from stained glass windows. Their religion is a pleasant thing of emotional quiver, divorced from the intellect, divorced from the will, and demanding little except lip service for a few harmless platitudes. In other words, it's marshmallow fluff. It's religious foo-foo. Can we have church without being in this building? Because this building is not the church. Who is the church? We are. We're the church. We are the church. And you know that song that we just sang a minute ago, Hosanna, Hosanna? What were they shouting when Jesus was riding the little white donkey into Jerusalem on the week before the crucifixion? They were shouting, Hosanna! They were laying their coats down. They were laying palm branches down. Remember, we talked all about that back in, um, in that season of the year, right before Easter time. And, and they were, but what happened by the end of the week? They changed Hosanna to crucify him. Crucify him. You see... There's a difference between somebody who honors God for who he is and somebody who goes through the motions like what we read in this little quote that I put here. Look at it. It's just a little emotional quiver. It's just soft organ music. It's just Jesus is my girlfriend songs like they play on the radio, right? And it's divorced from the intellect. What does that mean? Most people, when they go into a church experience, they check their brain at the door. 
And then when their head is empty, whoever's standing in front of them just stomps on their feet. The lid opens up. There's an empty cavity. They put in there whatever they want the person to puke back, and then they slam the lid down. We shouldn't do that, should we? Isn't our intellect a part of who we are? Isn't our will a part of who we are? Does not our intellect determine what our will does? It is, and it does. And when we align our lives with God's will, our behaviors will change, our thoughts will change, our world will change, our people will change, everything will change when we begin to look at who God is and we really take inventory of our own lives and we determine that I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to let God do in me what he wants to do in me. But sometimes we get full of ourselves, don't we? Has everybody, anybody ever told you you were full of yourself or full of something else? Huh? Has anybody ever told you that? We get very prideful. And one of the things we know is pride comes before a fall, doesn't it? When we're so proud that we have all the answers, we fall hard. And we can't even get time to get our hands up to catch ourselves. And a lot of times we fall flat on our face. And I don't know if you've ever fallen flat on your face and watched your face bounce off the floor before, but it is not a pleasant experience. It's not fun. And that's what happens. So Amos chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, we're going to find out that Amos is speaking now against the false confidence of the people. And I've given you kind of a little flow chart there. False confidence leads to complacency, which leads to danger. And that's how we came up with the title today, Complacency Invites Danger. So let's look at the first seven verses, and then we're going to come back and unpack it a little bit. What sorrow awaits you? That's a gr- I really want to hear what he's got to say next, don't you? Everything in the world today is happy, happy, happy. It's all good. Everything's going to be great. And he says, what sorrow awaits you? What sorrow awaits you who lounge in luxury in Jerusalem and you who feel secure in Samaria. You are famous and popular in Israel, and people go to you for help. But go over to Calneth and see what happened there. Then go to the great city of Hamath, down to the Philistine city of Gath. You are no better than they were, and look how they were destroyed. You push away every thought of coming disaster, but your actions bring the day of judgment closer. We're going to visit verse 3 for a second in a minute. How terrible for you who sprawl on ivory beds and lounge on your couches, eating meat of tender lambs from the flock and the choice calves fattened in the stall. You sing trivial songs to the sound of the harp and fancy yourselves to be great musicians like David. You drink wine by the bowlful and perfume yourselves with fragrant lotions. You care nothing about the ruin of your nation. Therefore, you will be the first to be led away as captives. Suddenly, all your parties will end. What's Amos saying? The fun is about to stop. It's about to get real. And as we look at these passages of Scripture, these seven verses, we find that self-confidence is a breeding ground of prideful thinking and action. Self-confidence self-confidence. What's the thing that we're trying so hard in our world for the last 30 years to build up in people? Self-confidence, right? We quit worrying about people's IQs and we started worrying about people's EQs. And if you go to a psychologist, this is their number one question and they'll repeat it to you a million times. Well, how'd that make you feel? How do you feel about that? You know, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. But one of the things that we have to accept and realize as followers of Christ, that it isn't all about us. It's absolutely not about us. God brings us salvation so we can share it with everybody. God heals us so that we can help people understand that God's a healing God. God works in our lives in ways that can only be explained by him being involved so that other people can realize there really is a God and he really is powerful and he really can change people's lives. He can take drug addicts and turn them into functioning people who love him and serve him and help other people who find themselves in the same position become functioning people. Can't he? How many of you in this room, God has turned some situation around in your life and then he's used that situation to help you help somebody else who found themselves in the same position? Anybody? Several of us, all of us, if we're honest. God's done things, unless we're just not doing anything for him. 
If we were doing something for God, it comes out of our experience. You see, faith is not just a blind leap off of a cliff. Faith is based in understanding and experience, isn't it? Faith is based on understanding and experience. When we begin to understand who God is and we see God working and we see God working in our lives, our faith becomes stronger. We don't get more faith. The faith that we have becomes stronger. We grow into our faith. And as we think about who God is, the more self-confident we become, the less reliant we are upon Him, correct? Because if humans are an end unto themselves and humanity is the premium for the world, man, we are screwed, aren't we? We are bad trouble if we're the best that there is. But if we have a God who is amazing, perfect, majestic, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful, and He wants us to be a part of what He's doing, and He equips us, and He gives us power, and He gives us wisdom, and He gives us knowledge, and we are to become more like Him, then we have the ability to become change agents in our world today. We can make a difference. And as we think about this, complacency is based on lies. We lie to ourselves to tell us how great we are. Instead of singing how great thou art, we sing how great I am. And don't we tell kids, we tell all of our little girls, oh, you're so good, you're so beautiful, you're a princess, blah, 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 blah. And we tell them all this stuff, and then they go out there in the world, and somebody says, somebody told you something that ain't true. We tell our boys, oh, you're going to be the best ball player. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. You can. And, and they go out there and they try and they fail. And somebody comes along and says, you need to do something different. Why do we set people up for failure? Why do we flatter people, butter them up? Why do we try to make? We want them to think well of us, don't we? And it builds up our self-confidence when we think we can just build somebody up. But here's the difference. When you introduce somebody to Jesus Christ, you are not there to build them up. You're to help them understand how wretched, miserable, and vile their life is without Christ and how they need Jesus Christ to come and cleanse them from their sin and set them free and give them the ability to become everything that God wants them to be. We got too many people out there trying to fix themselves. Fix themselves, right? Or we go to all of our friends and we get all of their opinions hoping to fix ourselves. If you haven't fixed you yet, you're not going to get fixed. Only God can fix you. Only God can equip you. Only God can give you the strength to move beyond whatever it is that keeps you held back in life. Only God can do that. And as we look at complacency, it's based on and motivated in lies, pride, and it leads to trusting someone other than God. Does that make sense to everybody? It's satisfaction of yourself and your achievements. How many of you know that when you're trying to find the happy place, has anybody tried to find the happy place? When you think you found the happy place, what did you just find out? It ain't happy there either, correct? And when you think that you find the next thing that's going to be the satisfaction of your life, what happens when you get that thing? You find yourself satisfied for a second. And the next thing you know, you need something else. You need something else. You need something else. We have people in relationships that think they're going to find their fulfillment in the next relationship. They move from relationship to relationship to relationship, thinking they're going to find somebody that's going to fulfill them. They move from job to job to job to job to job, trying to find out something that's going to fulfill them. They buy this, and they buy this, and they buy this, and they buy this, find something that's going to fulfill them. I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus Christ is all the fulfillment that you need in your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else gets added to you. Matthew 6, We need to memorize that verse, don't we? We need to quit looking at what we have and start looking at what we can do for God, because wealth tends to make us more self-indulgent, doesn't it? Wealth tends to make us more self-indulgent. Dave Ramsey says it like this, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't know. Don't we? You can't take it with you. You can't. No matter how much stuff you have, you can't take it with you. The only thing that gets to go to eternity is your soul and your spirit. And then when Jesus comes back, 
He's going to resurrect bodies that are dead, and he's going to make them new, and their the soul and the spirit are going to go back together, and those that are alive will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, and they're going to get to go walk with him right into heaven. So as we think about who God is uh, and what he wants, Jesus said himself, it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because most pre- rich people did it their way. They worship their riches. They worship their abilities. They worship what they do. But look at what happens to people. You know, I liked Tina Turner when she was way back there with Ike. I hated the fact of what she did to him or he did to her, and she got away from him. And then she went away for a while. And then when the Mad Max movies started coming back out, does anybody remember Mad Max? She was in one of the Mad Max movies called Beyond Thunderdome. That kind of kicked her career off again, and she started singing again. And she had it all. She died the other day at age 83, I believe it was. That'd be an amazing thing to live to be 83 years old. That'd be great, wouldn't it? But she died. And I hope and I pray that somebody talked to her at some point in her life and introduced her to Jesus Christ. Celebrities all the time. Why do we have shows like Celebrity Rehab and things like that? Why? Because a lot of young people get to be celebrities way too soon. They're not mature enough to handle it, and they just go berserk. They go nuts. They go off the deep end. Because somebody told them, if you just get to here, then you'll have everything you need, and you won't want anything anymore. And then what they do is they live a life of excess. It's like people who win the lottery Most people who win over a million dollars in the lottery are bankrupt within five years, and their families hate them because they won't give them any more money, and their their kids end up being drug addicts. You look up the statistics. It's terrible of what happens to people who come into a windfall of money and when what happens to their families from that. Because, you know, we say, I earned it. I have the right to spend it on myself, and I want to. Why do we buy things? Mostly. Why do we buy things? Because we need them or because we want them? Come on, just say it out loud. Why do we buy most things? Because we need it or we want it? How many of you say you only spend on things you need? (laughs) Oh, good. Nobody broke a commandment this morning. Nobody lied. (laughs) Right? So, how many of you buy things you want? How many of you wish you had more money so you could buy more things that you want? If you go to the right church, they'll tell you how you can get that. You just start giving God money, and he just starts giving you back everything. Not the way it works. Sorry. Because I know this, that if you truly surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you're going to live one of the hardest journeys that you've ever lived in your life. Because everywhere you turn and everywhere you look, somebody or some evil presence is going to try to knock you sideways or cause you to doubt God and who God is and what he's doing. It's not all about just thinking positively And those kind of things. And God is going to sort out the righteous from the complacent. Let's look at verse 3. How many people in our world today push away every thought of coming disaster? What do we say? Ignorance is what? Bliss. I would say that 75% of the people in this United States don't have a clue what's really going on in the world. Maybe more than 75%. And they don't want to know. Why? Why? then they're responsible for it. Because if you're not part of the solution, what are you? You're part of the problem, okay? We went to that rally the other day, and, and uh, it was not a hoorah, hoorah rally. It was an informational rally about what's coming and, and how it's going to work out and how we might get involved in different ways to kindly, nicely, not viciously like you see in a lot of places, talk to people who may be contemplating destroying a life, whether it's a baby or whether it's a young person, offering them the hope that comes in Jesus Christ, giving them the opportunity to maybe look at a sonogram to see that there really is a child inside of them, or to help children understand that, you know, one of the things that you need to look at is you're going to change your mind a hundred times in the next year. Once you make a decision that is a permanent solution to a temporary problem, you have no way to reverse that. Okay? Well, here's the thing we know about Christ. He makes all things new. He changes our minds. He changes our hearts. And there are too many people in our world partying like it's 1999. Aren't they? They're living like there's no consequences. They're living like they're never going to have to answer to anybody. They're living like if it doesn't bother me, then it's not my problem. 
But too many people have done that over the last 30 to 50 years, and what's the problem now? It's all our problems, isn't it? It's all our problem. It affects everybody and everywhere we go. Zephaniah 1, 12 through 13 says, I will search with lanterns in Jerusalem's darkest corners to punish those who sit complacent in their sins. They think the Lord will do nothing to them, either good or bad. So their property will be plundered, their homes will be ransacked, they will build new homes but never live in them, they will plant vineyards but never drink wine from them. Who is the Old Testament written to or about predominantly? Does anybody know? God's people, right? God's people. Well, God says he's going to find who's complacent and he's going to take everything away from them. He's going to take everything away from them. Look here in, in verse um, 6 and 7 you, of Amos chapter 6. He says, You drink wine by the bowlful and perfume yourself with pra- fragrant lotions. You care nothing about the ruin of your nation. Therefore, you will be the first to be led away as captives. Suddenly, all your parties will end. And they came three different times to take people out of Israel. And the first group they took out were the elites. Because when you take out the elites and the leadership, when you cut the head off the snake, what happens to the snake? It'll still wiggle, but it's not doing anything. It's going to die. And they took all the young people who were very, very promising, the the young people who were families, princely families and priestly families, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You heard about them, right? Daniel. They took them and they tried to re-educate them and turn them in to citizens of the captivity. And luckily those young people, and I, I hope that we still have some young people in our life that are willing to take a stand, said no. I'm not going to do that. That's not for me. I'm not going to disobey God. I'm going to do what God wants. Now, you can feed us whatever we ask you to feed us because we're not eating that. And then come back and check on us and see how we're doing. Or Daniel just said, okay, throw me in the lion's den. I don't care. God can protect me. How many of you really believe that God can protect you? We say it. Very easy to say it. Very easy to say, Jesus is Lord. Very easy to say, I believe. Very easy to sing these songs that we like the tunes to. But when it comes down to the nut cutting, what really happens? People run away like the hair's on fire when trouble comes. Or they curl up in a ball and they begin to whimper and whine. God is powerful. God is able. We need to live out of the victory that Jesus bought for us on the cross. And we need to live it large and we need to live it loud and we need to live it in front of people. Don't we? We do. It's easy to say when I'm in a room full of people, I believe. But what happens when you get singled out and you're the one who's under strict scrutiny? How many people can really say that? Well, I can tell you when the Jews were being prosecuted by the, by the Greeks back in the day when they were taking over Israel before the Romans showed up, a lot of men had surgeries to have their circumcision reversed or make it look like they were never circumcised so nobody could call them a Jew because they got right down to checking between their legs to see what they were. Okay? And a lot of people, to get the focus off them, said, oh, what about them? Go look at them. Look at who they are. Right? Right? They're the ones, not me, them. Is that a true believer? No. No. Jesus said what? You cannot be my disciple unless you're willing to take up your cross and follow me. How often? Daily. Daily. And what did Paul tell Timothy, the young preacher? He said, be ready to preach, whether it's in season or out of season, whether it's This time or that time, always be ready. And Peter said what? Always be willing to give a reason for the hope that lies within you with gentleness and respect. But what happens is when we talk to people even gently and respectfully, we are seen as hate-filled because we've spoken something that they don't want to hear because of their complacency, because of their self-centeredness, because of their belief that they're smarter than God. They don't want to hear it. But that doesn't mean we don't keep saying it. Does that make sense to everybody? We must share the good news. We must let people know. All the fun and games end when God determines the time for punishment to start. 
Have you ever talked to a police officer that says it's all fun and games till the red lights come up behind you? How many of you have ever had the red lights come up behind you and you're thinking, why is he bothering me? I didn't do anything wrong. Do you know there are going to be a lot of people at the end of time when Jesus comes back who are going to say, why, God, why can't I come with you? Why, Jesus, can't I come with you? Why can't I not come with you? I didn't do anything wrong. Because most people out there don't understand sin. They don't believe sin. They don't believe there's judgment. They don't believe any of it's coming. They believe that we can just do whatever we do and there's no consequences. And that's sad. It truly is. Because when I can do whatever I want to do and there's no consequences, that means you don't matter. Doesn't it? How is that for a way to look at other people? You don't matter. We need to find broken people. We need to find people that don't understand who God is and we need to help them understand who he is. Because here's the thing. It's harder to reach a good person than it is to reach somebody who knows they're not a good person. Because good people have all kinds of excuses about how good they are and what they've done. But the Bible tells us that God sees all of our righteousness as filthy rags. It's garbage when compared to his grace and his mercy and the sacrifice that Jesus provided. Now let's look at verses 8 through 14. Amos goes on to say, if there are 10 men left in one house, they will all die. This is when the conquest comes. And when a relative who is responsible to dispose of the dead goes to the house to carry out the bodies, he will ask the last survivor, is anyone else with you? When the person begins to swear, no, bye, he will interrupt and say, stop. Don't even mention the name of the Lord. What's going on in our world today? Don't even mention the name of the Lord, isn't it? It's what's going on. Don't even mention the name of the Lord. If you mention God's name, you're immediately awful, horrible, hateful, an ugly person. And we need to remember that if we're going to speak in God's name, we need to live like God exists. We can't be practical atheists. We have to have our lives in tune with his. It goes on to say this in verse um, 11. When the Lord gives the command, homes, both great and small, will be smashed to pieces. Can horses gallop over boulders? Can oxen be used to plow through them? But that's how foolish you are when you turn justice into poison and the sweet fruit of righteousness into bitterness. And you brag about your conquest of Lodabar. You boast, didn't we take Karnaim with our own strength? O people of Israel, I'm about to bring an enemy nation against you, says the Lord God of heaven's armies. They will oppress you throughout your land from Lebo Hamath in the north to the Arabah Valley in the south. Now, he's talking about total and utter destruction. And I gave you another little flow chart there. As you look at verses 9 through 11, it's going to be death and destruction and defeat. Here's why. God always wins. God always wins. And this once great nation is being defeated, it's being destroyed, and we're watching people die, aren't we? And who are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be the people in the lifeboats going out and rescue the perishing, care for the dying. And what do we do? We're so complacent in our own lives. We're so wrapped up in our own lives. We really don't give a darn about anybody else out there in the world as long as we can enjoy what we want to enjoy and do what we want to do. What we want to do. I think we need to become more compassionate. I think we need to find people who need Jesus and we need to talk to them about who he is. And if you've spent all your time talking to the same people and they're not listening, I'm going to give you a little bit of freedom right now. If they're not listening, God's not working in their life, go find somebody else to talk to. Because Jesus said this, he said, nobody comes to me unless the Father's drawing them. So if you're talking to people and they just don't want to hear it and they don't want anything to do with it, don't just cut them out of your life, but be there if they do ask a question, but go find somebody else new to talk to. Up until hmm, about five years ago, the last statistic I saw, 72% of people said that if they knew somebody who was really a true follower of Christ, that they would go to church with them just to check it out. 72% is a pretty good percentage, isn't it? That's more than the majority of people. Because people are looking for answers to their spiritual questions. They really are. And the devil has many, many answers to spread over our population. But the answer that we know and the answer that we trust and the answer that we believe is that Jesus is the answer. 
Old song, old hippie song we used to sing back in the day. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. Isn't he? He's not only the way, but he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So we automatically know that not everybody's going to make it to heaven. The road to hell is very wide, and many travel it, and the road to righteousness is very narrow, and few find their way there. I think we ought to make few a little bigger, don't you? I think we ought to invite a lot more people to come and find Jesus. I think we ought to help people understand that complacency leads to danger. It leads to danger. But we're very complacent in who we are. God guarantees there will be no recovery. When Jesus comes back, when the trump sounds and Jesus descends and the world is over, there's no other option. Just like when somebody dies, if they don't have Christ, there's no other option. There's no middle place. There's no place where you can go work your sins off. The Bible says to be absent from the body for those who are believers to be present with Christ. And the Bible also says to be absent from the body for those who are unbelievers is to be in terrible situations called hell, Gehenna, Hades, where it's just a holding place of torment until the final day of torment when the lake of fire is instituted. People don't want to believe that, but they believe aliens seeded the planet. They don't want to talk about the difference in this room of how a strand of DNA can be changed to make the variety that we have in this room. And they think that that's not created and it's not designed, it's just an accident. It's harder to be an atheist than it is to be a believer in Jesus Christ when it comes to looking at who God is and what God does and what we can understand about God. You really have to believe some crazy things to be an atheist. You do. You have to believe that this building just kind of came on its own and just existed. It didn't get built. And there were, it just happened. When the big bang happened, it just happened. But where did the bang come from? And what was there when the bang broke? And how did the bang make the things that it made? You ask those kind of questions and they don't have answers because it's not established fact. It's still theory. Isn't it? God's not theory. Jesus is real. He died and he rose again and he offers us abundant life. And that doesn't mean just lots of money. It means abundance of people in your life. It means abundance of love in your life. It means abundance of the ability to overcome whatever's in your life. But when people become complacent and they start relying on themselves, when the fall comes, when things start falling apart, crashing down, the fall is mighty, isn't it? They turn everywhere but to God. It doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, I can tell you, and I've told you before, that when I was at my lowest, when, when my drug addiction and my alcoholism was at its worst, God knocked me down. He put me on my knees. And I turned my life over to him. And I've been serving him ever since. And I love him. I will serve him because I love him. He's given life to me. I went from making a living to living for Jesus. There's a huge difference. I don't live to make a dollar anymore. You guys know that. You know what the budget is here. You know what my salary is. I don't live for money. But I'll tell you what. I hold tight to that passage of Scripture that says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. My God will supply all my needs according to His riches in glory. And so I can't be complacent. I can't just be full of myself. And, you know, when I stand up here and I'm in front of you, a lot of people think, well, Pastor Ron, he likes to be up front. No, I don't. I really don't. Because what happens is, Everybody starts comparing themselves to me instead of to Jesus, and there's no comparison. Zero. None. Right? Any trained monkey can do what I do. Anybody. All you have to do is put in the work, put in the study, and understand God's Word, and you can share it with anybody. But the qualifying factor is you must be born again. There are too many people out there who stand in my position who don't believe in God, they don't believe His Word, but they still want to stand up in front of a group of people and talk about platitudes and things like that. You know, we've had people come to our church 
and say, the reason they came to our church was because they listened to me on the radio. And I said, you listened to me on the radio and you still came? Yeah, because you don't candy coat anything. You can take a poison pill and cover it in chocolate and kill somebody with it, can't you? You sure can. But if you take life and you expose people to life, the life that is Jesus Christ, the life that God provides, and you help them see the value in living a life surrendered to Jesus Christ, and you help them understand that even though it gets bad, and even though it's horrible sometimes, and even though I don't know that I can get there, I know that he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll always be with me. If this world kills me, I'll be with him. And as long as I'm on the earth, I can serve him. And that's what God wants from us. He doesn't want us to be complacent. He doesn't want us to just call on him when we have an emergency. He doesn't want us to just call on him when we can't figure it out after we've been through everybody that we know. Well, here's the problem. I want you to take just a second and visualize something with me. I'm not going to say anything other than this. Think about everybody that you know. And then think about the problems that you go through and... If everybody that you know only knows what you know, you're kind of in trouble, aren't you? Aren't you? If they're only as smart as you are, and they only, you need lots of different kinds of people in your life. You need somebody who's a go-getter. You need somebody who knows where everything is. You need somebody who's been through and drugged down the road behind a truck for a while so they know what the pain feels like, so they can help you when you're going through the pain. But what do we do? We just surround ourselves with a couple of people that we like, and then we, don't, we cut ourselves out from everybody just because we're a little different, just because something doesn't look the same or sound the same. And do you know what? Most of the time we make a choice when we're walking up to somebody whether we think we're going to like them or not, don't we? We've already made our mind up. I don't think I'm going to like them. Well, here's what you get with me. You either like me or you don't. There's no middle ground. Anybody agree with that? And they all said, amen. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because when we're real, people have a hard time dealing with us. When we're fake, people don't understand us. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't mess around. Don't be like a wave pushed everywhere. Being called God's chosen people and operating from a position of formidable strength will not even be enough to overcome the impending disaster. Look at verses 12 and 13 with me for a minute. God desire, God's dealings with his people have been as useless as plowing rocks would be. Look at what he says. He says, when the Lord gives the command, homes both great and small will be smashed to pieces. Can horses gallop over boulders? Do we have any horse people in the room today? What's the hardest thing on horses' feet and legs? Rocks. They don't like to go over rocks in the water. They don't like to run over rocks. But what do we see when we watch a Western movie? They run them up the mountain and slide them down in the shale. And horses, you can hurt them bad. And then he talks, can oxen plow rocks? Now, we don't know anything about that today. We've seen it. We've seen pictures of it. We've seen opportunities of maybe hearing stories from grandparents or great-grandparents, how they stood behind the ox as the plow was going through the ground. And then what do you have to do when you knock a rock loose? You've got to pick it up and move it. But go over to West Virginia. I'm telling you what, everything over there is made out of groundhog shale. There's no real dirt over there hardly anywhere. And when you start trying to dig that up and you start trying to plow that, how many of you have ever tried to dig a hole with a post hole digger or dig a hole with a shovel and all you get into is all the rock they use to fill in before they put a little bit of dirt on top of it? It's fun, isn't it? The hardest thing to do is plow a rocky field. Do you know where most of the rock walls and rock fences come from around farms? Those kids who lived there, the dad said, pick that rock up and take it over there. Pick that rock up and take it over there. Pile it in a pile, we'll make a fence. And what God is saying here, he says, can horses gallop over boulders? Can oxen be used to plow them? But that's how foolish you are when you turn justice into poison and the sweet fruit of righteousness into bitterness. Do we live in a just world anymore? No, we haven't lived in a just world for a long time. What was once considered good is now considered evil. And once was, what was once considered evil is now let go. And righteousness? Does anybody believe righteousness is missing in our world today? 
It absolutely is. Righteousness is missing. And what righteousness is, is right standing with God. And the only way that we can have right standing with God is to have our sins forgiven and live out our salvation with fear and trembling like Paul said, and to become holy like Jesus is holy. That's exactly what righteousness is. But you talk to most of the people in in Generation Z, that's the kids that are like 20 and younger. They don't even know there is God. Or they know that God doesn't exist. They've already made their minds up that God doesn't exist. So who do you think's winning the battle there? Satan's winning the battle, isn't he? But he's also winning because there are so many complacent people out there who don't have a broken heart for people who are going to spend eternity separated from Christ. Because we're complacent. Because we're indifferent. Because we, we just live our lives like our lives are the only thing that matters. And when we do that, God's not pleased. Does anybody believe that God's pleased when we live our lives like that? No. And if God's not pleased, we ought to change that, shouldn't we? God speaks and warns and threatens, but they don't listen. God speaks and warns and threatens, but they don't listen. So here's my question this morning. How about us? How about us? Do we listen? Are our ears open? Are our hearts broken for lost people? Do we care that babies are being murdered? Do we care that young people's lives are being irreparably changed and they're going to be nothing? Because what they are, they don't want to be, and what they want to become, they can never be. Who's lying to our kids? Who's lying to our kids, and why are they believing the lies? The reason they believe the lies is because there's not enough truth out there. Because the Bible says when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. It will set you free. And we need to be truth speakers, but we need to speak truth in love. We need to be people who care. And we need to care about other than just that little group of people that are around us. We need to open our hearts a little bit more. We need to open our minds a little bit more. We need to open our purview a little bit more and include more and more and more kinds of people into our world. Don't we? And you can't do that if you're hiding up in the holler. And you can't do that if your schedule is so busy that you don't have time and you pass yourself twice a week. Can't do that. But you see... We do what's important to us, and most of the time, what's important to us just feeds what we've been talking about all day today. Me, mine, that's what I'm important, what's important to me, me and mine. We need to look beyond that. We need to look to God for hope. The greatest achievements are nothing but nothing burgers, all right? That word Lodabar, he says here, He says, um, are you, uh, and you brag about your conquest of Lodabar. Lodabar is not a place. The word Lodabar means nothing. Your conquest of nothing. How many people go to college for four years and graduate and they have a nothing degree? Just a liberal arts degree, a nothing degree. How many people spend their lives Chasing this and chasing that, and they have nothing. You see, all the things that we think are important are nothing as far as God's concerned. Nothing. And we think that we're something because we've conquered nothing. And then he makes another little play on words. He says, you boast, didn't we take car name by our own strength? Well, the word car name is the Hebrew word for strength. So our strength is stronger than the strength that we just defeated. Okay. Hmm. But isn't God the most strong? Isn't God almighty? Doesn't that mean he's stronger than anybody and anything? So our strength is nothing compared to God's strength. And what he's talking about here is a couple battles that Jeroboam won. And the people were all full of themselves because they defeated a couple little minor towns. And, and Amos is saying, you beat nobody. There's a nothing burger. There's nothing there. No, nothing to be proud of. But you see, we've been taught to believe that if we even just put forth an effort, we should be proud of it. 
What happened to doing our best? Well, when you do your best, it's not rewarded in the world anymore, is it? They want everybody at mediocre or less. Because if everybody's at mediocre, then nobody can be shining any, outshining anybody, and there's never anybody in the bottom. But let me tell you what. If I go to have something medically done on me, I want the guy who graduated in the top half of his class working on me, not the guy that worked in the bottom half of his class. How about you? That's what I want. I want an overachiever. I want somebody who knows it inside, outside, upside down, and can do it with a blindfold on. That's the guy I want working on me. I don't want somebody that walks in there and they have to get their phone out or their textbook out and say, oh, oh, that's what that is. How many of you have been to the doctor when they've said, well, I have bad news for you? And then the next time you go and they say, oh, it's not that, it's something else. Happens all the time, doesn't it? Well, you see, in our world today, nobody's giving anybody the good news that Jesus saves and Jesus cares and God has a plan. They're giving everybody the bad news of this is what it is and it's just the way it's going to play out and there's nothing we can do about it. And we can't follow Christ and believe that lie because God can change people. He changed you if you belong to him. He gave you life if you belong to him. He gave you the hum humility to surrender yourself to him and say, I'm a sinner and I need you as my savior if you belong to him. That's what God did for you. And the moment you did that, he wiped away all your sins. And he poured his grace into your life and he poured his mercy into your life. And he's always there for you when you cry out to God in the middle of the night, when you cry out to God when you're driving down the road, when you spend time with God because you're desirous to spend time with God. He always cares and he always wants to hear whatever's going on in your life. But you see, he already knows, doesn't he? He already knows. He just wants you to be involved in the transaction between you and him. Verse 14, the destruction is going to be from top to bottom. There's no hope of victory when God is your enemy. Do you hear that? There's no hope of victory when God is your enemy. Because nobody can outdo God. Nobody can defeat God. It looks like God's being defeated in our world today, doesn't it? No, God is permitting this to happen. He's allowing this to happen. He's showing us how foul and how filthy and how awful it can be in our world. And I don't think we've even begun to scratch the surface of what it's going to look like. Because the Bible says that as the end days get closer and closer and closer, evil is going to become more rampant. And here's the deal today. Satan's doing his work right out in front of everybody and nobody's even questioning it hardly. You believe that? Anybody believe that? Satan is doing his best work right out in front of everybody, and nobody's even yelling about it, screaming about it, jumping up and down, or saying, hey, warning, warning, warning. You know, danger, Will Robinson, danger, danger, danger. Nobody's doing that. Well, from Satan's point of view, a person vaccinated with a mild case of Christianity is completely protected from the real thing. That's all I got to say about that. From Satan's perspective, a person vaccinated with a mild case of Christianity is completely protected from the real thing because we even become complacent in our walk with God. 